Welcome to Ada Core University. My name is Quentin Ocean and today I'm going to show you a program that manipulates 10 balls on the screen and make them bounce on the edges of the screen. Let's get started. The mathematics that we are going to use here to describe the movement of the balls is different from what we've done before. We are not going to use cosinus and sinus, but a vector of direction dx dy, which will represent the direction in the axis on ordinate axis. At each iteration, each ball is going to move following this dx dy vector. The program that is going to implement this behavior is slightly more complicated than the previous one. This is mainly for two reasons. First of all, we'll have to manipulate a collection of objects on the screen. So we will need a way to implement this collection. The other reason is that there is some kind of randomization that is going to be required here to have 10 balls moving into 10 different directions. Let's see how that looks like. As you can see here, I have those 10 balls that are bouncing on the edges of the screen. As a matter of fact, if you look closely, they don't quite seem to be bouncing on the left and right hand side of the screen. But that's because I'm considering a system that is square, going from minus 100 to 100 in each coordinate. But the view here is not quite square. If I resize it, to something more squarish, I will get a result that looks uh, much better. Let's now see how to program this application. As in the previous example, the movement of the object is going to be taken care of by a procedure iterate. So you will see the same kind of construction here, in particular the in-out parameter. However, here the semantics are going to be a bit different since I'm not rotating the object, I'm translating it. And if I get out of the boundaries of the screen, I want to reverse the direction of the movement. That's what is done with those two first conditions. So, as you can see here, I'm extracting the value of the x axis of the shape and then I'm comparing it within a range. So there's two new ADA constructions here. The not in operator which checks that a given value is not in a range. Uh, as you may imagine there is an in operator as well which checks that a value is in a range and a way to denote a range which is number or lower bound, dot dot, upper bound. Once I have dx and dy, the movement operation is pretty simple. I'm just retrieving the current x or y of the shape and then adding the value of dx or dy to it. We are now going to do something a tad more complicated, which is random number generation. As a matter of fact, if you are already accustomed to doing that with other languages such as C or Java or C++, it will be very similar. We want to construct a random number and for doing so we are going to use a function that returns a value from 0 to 1 and then manipulate this value to create something that looks like our expectation. In ADA, 
there is a standard library that provides such a function which is called ADA numerics float random which is why I'm adding a dependency on my program using this with and use clauses. The next step is to create a seed that will be used to generate those numbers. The seed can be used to create pseudo random numbers, for example, initializing it uh, according to the clock or player input or anything. However, in this case, I'm keeping it simple, so uh, the seed is just um, keeping its default value, which will mean that the numbers that are going to be generated by this seed are always going to be the same ones. We are now getting into the business of creating a random value within a certain range. So the first thing I'm getting here is a random value between 0 and 1. But that's not enough. I want something smaller and I want this number to be potentially positive or negative. So let's carry on. To get something smaller, I'm multiplying it by a small number 0.05 for example, in order to construct a value between 0 and 0 0.05. But at the same time, I don't want a value that is too small, that is to say too close to 0. So I'm adding 0 0.02 in order to construct a value that's between 0 0.02 and 0 0.07. I now want this number to be either positive or negative. So I am computing a new random number between 0 and 1 and I'm saying that if this number is above 0.5, which is half the cases, then I'm evaluating 1, otherwise I'm evaluating minus 1. So this sub-expression value is either minus 1, either 1. Multiplying those two values gives me the desired effect, that is to say a value that is either between minus 0.07 to minus 0.02 and plus 0.02 to 0.07. I've created my random number. Let's now look how to handle collections of objects. Ada provides various ways to handle collections, lists, maps, stacks, etc, etc. But the basic element to handle a collection of objects is an array, and that's what we're going to see here. As you may remember from one of the previous lessons, I mentioned the fact that Ada was a strongly typed language. One of the effects of that is that it is not possible to just create an array at the time of a variable declaration. An array needs to be typed so an array type needs to be declared beforehand. That's what we're doing here with this type ball array. One of the things that need to be specified on this type is the type which is going to be used for the indexing. In Ada, any discrete type can be used for the indexing. So that includes, of course, integers, but enumerations as well for example, it will be possible to index an array on the character type or the boolean type. There are two main categories of arrays in Ada. Those that have a size defined at the type declaration time and those that don't and need a size to be defined at the variable declaration time. And when I mean size, what I should say actually is boundaries, but we will see that um, later on. If I write range box here, what I mean is that the boundaries of the array are not known at the type declaration time and they will have to be specified for each instance, for each object or variable individually. Finally, the last information that needs to be defined on an array type 
is the type of its contents. One important point to understand in particular if you are coming from reference-based languages such as Java is that in ADA, components of the array needs all to have the same size. But here it's fine, ball type is a record of three fields, so all objects of type ball type are of the same size and I can use that for the array elements. Once the type is declared, I can use it in a variable declaration, such as here. And because the type is unconstrained, I need to provide a size for the array at variable declaration time. Now again, I'm not providing the actual size. I am providing the boundaries, the inclusive lower bound and upper bound. So this array balls here is indexed between 1 to 10, so indeed it contains 10 elements. But I could I have decided to index it from 0 to 9, or for 100 to 109, to give the same size and different indexes. There is no requirement in ADA to index an array from any given number. The next step here is to initialize all the 10 elements of the array. For this, I'm going to use a structure that is very close to the one I've used before with the record types, which is an aggregate. From the others reserved word here, I am specifying that the initialization expression I'm going to provide is going to be the same expression for every single element of the array. There are ways to be more specific about how to initialize these things, but uh, we will see that in a further lesson. And in this very case, the expression that is being used to initialize each element is itself an aggregate. So if you will, this is a record aggregate nested within an array aggregate. One important thing to realize here is that what I'm saying is that the same expression is going to be used by all the elements, not the same value. In other words, this expression is going to be evaluated for each single element random is going to be called for each single element. So uh, 40 times overall, since I call random four times per element. Therefore, this will create 10 different objects, each of them going into a separate direction. The last step of this program is to call each rate of every single ball at each cycle. In order to iterate through all of the elements of ball, I'm going to use the for of loop. So by saying for b of balls, I mean iterate over all the elements of ball and store each successive value into the variable b. Let's now do a very quick quiz session to verify your understanding. There are a few errors on this program. Click on them and hit Submit. There were three errors to be found on this program. Let's see them one by one. First of all, I forgot to specify range box to say that ball list is an unconstrained array, that the size will be given by the variable declaration. Now, interestingly, this line, as it's written right now, it does mean something in ADA. It means that ball list is an array that is indexed by integer and that contains as many elements as there is values for the range of integer. So that's 4 billion something elements 
it's highly unlikely that I'm going to be able to fit such an array uh, in the memory. It does make sense though if the type used for the index is smaller. We'll see that in the further lesson. In the aggregate, I forgot to specify that the expression I was constructing was to provide a value to all the elements of the array, so I missed to write others arrow to specify that. And finally, each rating over the elements of an array is the for off loop, not the for in loop. Now there is a for in loop that you may know if you have done ADA before, which iterates over the indexes of an array. And again, this is one of the things that we will see in more detail into a further lesson. Here goes the same program with all the programming mistakes fixed. This concludes this lesson of Adaco University. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, stay tuned, there is much more to come.